Greetings traveler, make yourself comfortable. Today we shall tell you a tale about golden hair or sif and how goats received their finest treasures. Aesir goddess Sif was a beautiful wife of Thor, who loved her for her blue eyes and her pale skin, her red lips and her smile, and allowed her long, long hair, the color of field of barley at the end of summer. Once Thor woke and stared at sleeping Sif. He scratched his beard, then he tapped his wife to wake her up. What happened to you? he asked. She opened her eyes, the color of summer sky. What are you talking about? she asked. And then she moved her head and looked puzzled. Her fingers reached up to her bare pink skull and touched it, exploring it tentatively. She looked at her, horrified. My hair was all she could muster. Thor nodded. It's gone, he said. He has left you bold. He as if Thor said nothing. He strapped on his belt of power, making Gjord, which doubled his enormous strength. Loki, he said. Loki has done this. Why do you say that? asked Sif, touching her bald head frantically, as if the fluttering touch of her fingers would make her hair return. Because, said Thor, when something goes wrong, the first thing I always think is it is Loki's fault. It saves a lot of time. Thor found Loki's door locked, so he pushed through it, leaving it in pieces. He picked Loki up and said only, why? Why what? Loki's face was a picture of perfect innocence. Sif's hair. My wife's golden hair. It was so beautiful. Why did you cut it off? A hungry expression chased each other across Loki's face. Cunning and shiftness, truculence and confusion. Thor shook Loki hard. Loki then looked down and did his best to appear ashamed. It was funny, I was drunk. Thor's bro lowered. Sif's hair was her glory. People will think that her head was shed for punishment, that she did something she should not have done, did it with someone she should not have. Well, yes, there is that, said Loki, as they will probably think that, and unfortunately, given that I took her hair from the roots, she will go through the rest of her life completely bald. No, she won't. To look up at Loki, whom he was now holding far above his head, with an expression of cold rage. I am afraid she will, but there are always hats and scarves, she won't go through life bold, said Thor, because Loki love for his son. If you do not put her hair back right now, I am going to break every single bone in your body, each and every one of them. And if her hair does not grow properly, I will come back and break every bone in your body again. And again, if I do it every day, I'll soon get really good at it. He carried on, sounding slightly more cheerful. No, said Loki, I can't put her hair back. It doesn't work like that. Today, muttered Thor, it will probably take me about an hour to break every bone in your body. But I bet that with practice I could get it down to about... Fifteen minutes. It will be interesting to find out. Dwarfs, shrieked Loki. What were you saying? Dwarfs, they can make anything. They could make golden hair for Sif. Hair that would bound with her scalp and grow normally. Perfect golden hair. They could do it. I swear they could. Then, said Thor, you had better go and talk to them. And he dropped Loki from high above his head onto the floor. Loki clambered to his feet and hurried away before Thor would change his mind. 
He put on his shoes that led him travels through the sky, and he went to Svart Alfheimer, where the dwarves have their workshops. The most ingenious craftsman of them all, he decided, were the three dwarves known as the Sons of Ivaldi. Loki went to their underground forge. Greetings, Sons of Ivaldi. I have asked around, and people here tell me that Brock and his brother Atri are the greatest dwarf craftsmen they are or have ever been, said Loki. No, said one of the Sons of Ivaldi. It's us. We are the greatest craftsmen there are. I was assured that Brock and Atri can make treasures as good as those you can. Lies, said the tallest of sons of Ivaldi. I wouldn't trust those fumble-fingered incompetents to shoe a horse. The smallest and the wisest of the sons of Ivaldi simply shrugged. Whatever they make, we could do better. I heard that they challenge you, said Loki. Three treasures. The gods of Ace will judge who made the best treasure. Oh, and by the way, one of the treasures you make needs to be hair, ever-growing, perfect golden hair. We can do that, said one of the sons of Ivaldi. Even Loki could barely tell them apart. Loki then went across the mountain to see the dwarf called Brock, as the workshop he shared with his brother Atri. Ivaldi's sons are making three great treasures as gifts for the gods of Asgard, said Loki. The gods are going to judge the treasures. Ivaldi's sons want me to tell you that they are certain you and your brother Atri can't make anything as good as they can. They called you fumble fingered incompetence. Brock was no fool. This smells extremely fishy to me, Loki, he said. Are you sure this isn't your doing? Stirring up troubles between Atri and me. And Ivaldi's boy seems like the sort of thing you do. Loki looked as guileless as he could, which was amazingly guileless. Nothing to do with me, he said innocently. I just thought you ought to know. And you have no personal stake in this, asked Brock. None whatsoever. Brock nodded and looked up at Loki, Brock's brother, Atri was a great craftsman, but Brock was the smarter of the two, and the more determined. Well then, we'll be happy to take on the sons of Ivaldi in a test of skill, to be judged by the gods. Because I have no doubt that Atri can forge better and craftier things at Ivaldi's lot. But let's make this personal, Loki, eh? What do you have in mind? asked Loki. Your head, said Brock. If we win this contest, we get your head, Loki. There's a lot of things going on in that head of yours, and I have no doubt that A3 could make a wonderful device out of it. A sinking machine, perhaps? Or an inkwell? Loki kept smiling, but he scowled on the inside. The day had started out so well. Still... He simply had to ensure that Atri and Brock lost the contest. The god would still get six wonderful things from the dwarves, and Sif would get her golden hair. He could do that. He was lucky. Of course, he said. My head, no problem. Across the mountains, the sons of Ivaldi were making their treasures. Loki was not worried about them, but he needed to make sure that Brock and Atri did not, could not, possibly, win. Brock and Atri entered the forge. It was dark in there, lit by the orange glow of burning charcoal. Atri took a pigskin from the shelves and placed it into the forge. I've been keeping this pigskin for something like this, he said. Brock just nodded. Right, said Atri. You work the bellows, Brock. Just keep pumping them. I need this hot, and I need it consistently hot. Otherwise, it won't work. Brock began to pump the bellows, sending a stream of oxygen-rich air into the heart of the forge, heating everything up. He had done it many times before. Atri watched until he was satisfied that it would all be to his liking. 
Then he left to work on his creation outside the forge. As he opened the door to go out, a large black insect flew in. It was not a horsefly, and it was not a deer fly. It was bigger than either. It flew in and circled the room in a malicious way. Brock could hear the sound of Atri's hammers outside the forge, and the sound of filling and twisting, of shaping and banging. The large black fly, it was the biggest blackest fly you have ever seen, landed on the back of the Brock's hand. Both of Brock's hands were on the bellows. He did not stop pumping to sway at the fly. The fly bit Brock hard on the back of the hand, but Brock kept pumping. The door opened and Atri came in and carefully pulled the wok from the forge. It appeared to be a huge boar with bristles of gleaming gold. Good work, said Atri. A fraction of a degree warmer or cooler, and the whole thing would have been a waste of our time. Good work, you too, said Brock. The black fly up on the corner of the ceiling seized with resentment and irritation. A3 took a block of gold and placed it on the forge. Right, he said. This next one will impress them. When I call, start pumping the bellows, and whatever happens, do not slow down, or speed up, or stop. There's fiddly work involved. Got it, said Brock. Atri left the room and began to work. Brock waited until he heard Atri's call, and he started to pump the bellows. The black fly circled the room thoughtfully. After a while, it landed on Brock's neck. The insect stepped aside daintily to avoid droplets of sweat, whose air was hot in the forge. It bit Brock's neck as hard as it could. Scarlet blood joined the sweat on Brock's neck. But the dwarf did not stop pumping. A3 returned. He removed a white horde armoring from the forge. He dropped it into the stone cooling pool to quench it. There was a cloud of steam as the armoring fell into the water. The ring cooled, moving rapidly from orange to red hot, and then as it cooled to gold. It's called Draupnir, said Aitri. The dripper? What a funny name for a ring, said Brock. Not for this one, said Atri, and he explained to Brock what was so very special about the arm ring. Now, said Atri, there's something I've had in mind to make for a very long time now, my masterwork, but it's even trickier than the other two. So what do you have to do is pump and don't stop pumping, said Brock. That's right, said Atri. Even more than before, do not change your pace, or the whole thing will be ruined. A3 picked up an ingot of pig iron, bigger than any ingot that the black fly, who was Loki, had ever seen before, and he hefted it into the forge. He left the room and called out to Brock to begin pumping. Brock began to pump, and the sound of Atri's hammers began as Atri pulled and shaped and welded and joined. Loki, in fly's shape, decided that there was no more time for subtlety. Atri's masterpiece would be something that would impress the gods, and if the gods were impressed enough, then he would lose his head. Loki landed between Brock's eyes and started to bite the dwarf's eyelids. The dwarf continued to pump, his eyes stinging. Loki bit deeper, harder, more desperately. Now blood ran from the dwarf's eyelids into his eyes and down his face, blinding him. Brock squinted and shook his head, trying to dislodge the fly. He jerked his head from side to side. 
He contorted his mouth and tried blowing air up the fly. It was no good. The fly continued to bite, and the dwarf could see nothing but blood. A sharp pain filled his head. Brock then counted, and at the bottom of the downstroke, he whipped one hand from the bellows and swiped at the fly with such speed and such strength that Loki barely escaped with his life. Brock grabbed the bellows once again and continued to pump. Enough, called Atri. The black fly flew unsteadily above the room. Atri opened the door, allowing the fly to escape. He then looked at his brother with disappointment. Brock's face was a mess of blood and sweat. I don't know what you were playing at that time, said Atri. But you came close to ruining everything. The temperature was all over the place at the end. As it is, it's nowhere near as impressive as I'd hoped. Locking his human shape strolled through the open door. So, all ready for the contest? he asked. Brock can go to Asgard and present my gifts to the gods and cut off your head, said Atri. I like it best here, at my forge, making things. Brock stared at Loki through swollen eyelids. I'm looking forward to cutting off your head, said Brock. It got even more personal. And that will be all for today. I hope you like the first part of the story. Let me know what you think about this tale, Loki's trickery and dwarf craftsman. Come here again, we have a lot of stories to tell.